Welcome to the final episode of our three-part series on quality coaching with legendary lacrosse coach Bill Tierney as he tells us what it's like not only to win national championship, but to do it with both of his sons on the team. This is Sportlight Sport Report. You, I mean, um, I'm just thinking back to you probably did uh, on the treadmill and, and when you were in the physiology class, you probably ended up running about four or five miles. <laughs> exactly. And way and, too and I, love, I love my strength coaches too, right? Because I was one, but the idea that you're going to run one mile a week of practice on a Monday, like you're going to be okay. Like the strength <laughs> exactly. power aspect is not going to like, you know, that's not going to cause you to be a step slower and lose the game. That's not what's going to do. That, that's, that's for sure. And uh, I go back to the, uh, in 2001, probably the, the greatest thing that could ever happen to me as a dad is uh, we won a national championship with my two sons on the field. And I remember after the game, my son, Trevor was a, was our goalie and uh, was a first team all American saved the game in overtime and, and we won in overtime. And so at the end of the game, they bring, they bring you into this big media thing. And it's, you know, it's the biggest event in lacrosse, right? There's hundreds of, of reporters and cameras and it's really, it's really pretty cool. And, but they put you up on the stairs with two or three of the players. And I remember one of the reporters saying to my son, Trevor, he goes, uh, why is it that you guys always seem to pull these close games out at the end? And, and Trevor kind of, he was two or three players removed from me. He kind of looked down at me and said, can I tell him? And he goes, I said, tell, you know, I just won a national championship with my two sons. I didn't care what he said. And he goes, he points at me and he goes, he makes things so hard during the week that the games are so much fun for us, you know? And so uh, even, even the overtime and high pressure ones. So, you know, you, you, you do some things that are somewhat questionable, but if you keep telling them it's going to be a reward, it's just like our kids in Denver. Now we, when we're running them hard, we tell them, uh, you know, you're at whatever percent oxygen that the kids on the East coast are. So when we play them, you're going to be in better shape. Now, I don't know if that's physiologically true or not, but as long as they believe it, that we're in good shape. Right. Well, I think that speaks to the that speaks to the interdisciplinary of sports and performance, and that the unique role that a coach has, like yourself too, even with a strength coach and sports medicine and sports psychologist and nutritionist and the staff, you've got to try to decide with your staff and and everybody else. We need more technical. We need more mental. We need more conditioning. We need more recovery. You, you know, you've got to make those decisions and everybody else is in their, their silo as a support person. You know, whereas the head coach, especially, you know, with the assistant coaches have to make those challenging calls. That it, it, it's, a, it's not a clear path. It's no, not it's a yes not. or a no. It's not. I think the key to that, Brian, is, you know, and I remember the first meeting I had with my team here at Denver when I got here, I introduced them to the to our AD, who at the time was Peg Bradley Doppis. She was a phenomenal woman. You know, I just love her to death. And and anybody that our kids might, the, the, the academic support people, our trainer, our strength coach, our assistant coaches, obviously, and our, our directors of operations. And I said to them, if they say something, it's like me saying something. Because you're right, they have their column. And to them, their column is as important if we didn't have a strength coach, our guys wouldn't be as successful scoring goals. And that may not look like a direct correlation, but it certainly is. Um, if we didn't have a nutritionist, our guys would be eating McDonald's every day. If we didn't have, uh, you know, uh, the people helping uh, the academic support people, they might not be in school. All these different things, there's pillars of, of parts. And the, the job, as you mentioned, the job of the head coach is to number one, make each one of those pillars important to the, to the young men or young woman you're coaching, and then to figure out how the big picture comes together. And then happily or sadly at times, you got to make those tough decisions on what, what's going to happen that day or that moment so that on a Saturday afternoon, you're at peak performance and the kids are doing well and enjoying what they're doing. What, what do you think has been the differentiating factor for you over so many years and maintaining that level of success. You know, what is it then about the pillars and your bringing it together that you're doing a little bit better than other people, quite frankly? 
Well, I'm not sure if I'm doing better than other people. I've just been very lucky with the people I've picked for my staff and have great players work at great institutions. But I do think that uh, you got to you got to be mindful of um, of, you know, what you are going through personally so that you understand. It's just like the it's just like the the the. the the favorite son of a dad who passes away has to give the eulogy. You know, you, you, you know, somebody's got to do it. And, and so, you know, I learned something a long time actually from a, a priest friend of mine at Princeton and not a religious thing, but I, I remember saying to him, God, you know, Tom, I, sometimes I feel like I've got to teach lessons to people and I'm certainly no perfect human being here. And, and he said, just remember that, you know, you're going to deal with somebody greater than you, you know, whether it be your boss or, you know, when we all pass away, somebody, somebody really greater than us. But right now they're looking to you and, and you are their only, their only source. So that after a game, you might be distraught about a decision you made. You might have played the wrong goalie, you, you know, whatever might have happened. You might have made a bad uh, techno, technical choice. You're going to feel bad for yourself, about yourself, but um, you got 50, 18 to 22 year olds looking at to you for guidance. And so I've always gone by the mantra of coaches lose games, players win them. And, and what I mean by that is quickly, they work so hard during the week, take the burden from them. They already feel bad enough about the loss, you know, take the burden from them. They'll get over it. They'll be fine. They'd, by Monday, they'll, they'll come back and they'll be fine. But accept the burden for yourself because you're an adult and you've got you to gotta handle this stuff. And so um, I think that those, just having that, those kinds of things, being aware, uh, making those people around you just as important as you and, and, and patting them on the back and thanking them every once in a while and, and just doing the little things that um, make them know that, you know, they are important to you and your program. Because as I always say, look, we're, we're going to get the accolade. I'm going to be the guy on that dais. My, my trainer is not, you know, and so, but she may have helped our best player get through a hamstring pull just before the semifinals or the finals. So uh, you just, I think it's being clear uh, to the fact that we're, we're a village and uh, somebody elected me uh, mayor of the village, but uh, we're, we're all in this together. If you could uh, go back in time to when you first started coaching and uh, share a little wisdom with yourself that you've learned over the years, what, what do you think that might be? Well, the, the one thing that I've been sharing lately um, that, that I, I actually took my own advice, even though I didn't know it was going to be my advice later on, which is, uh, you know, uh, whenever I say this name to young people, they look at me like, coach, you're getting old. There's, but I, but I quote Yogi Berra every once in a while. And then Yogi Berra had some great sayings. And I tell him, look it up on Google. That'll show you. But uh, one of the great things Yogi Berra said, when you're coming to a fork in the road, take it. And, and I always, until I got to Princeton, every one of my jobs was three years or less because I always felt like it was a new challenge. Um, maybe a little bit more money too, but the, that wasn't true when I went from high school foot coaching to RIT. I actually took a $3,000 pay cut with three children under the age of four, but uh, uh, thankfully I have a very supportive wife who thought that was going to be a cool adventure. But I, I, I think that uh, if, if I gave my, my, myself the advice back then would be to... Um, would be to, number one, be a little easier on the referees. Um, and, and number two, uh, just just to realize that at, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, the things you're doing for these young people are so much bigger than whether you won that day or not. You know, I, 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 I tell the story often about when pe people give me so many, so much, you know, praise that I don't deserve. Um, but you know, I always go back when it gets too overwhelming. I did an interview last week and they're calling me a legend of this and a legend. Of this. I said, you got to stop because, you know, my last high school coaching experience, I was coaching a girls basketball team. We got off the bus and we scored the first basket. We went in two nothing and we scored the last basket. Well, unfortunately, the other team scored 72 points in between our first and last basket and we lost 72 to four. And that was the last thing I coached before going up to RIT to coach lacrosse and having this 
successful lacrosse career. So I always look back at that and I think of those girls and you know what, by the time we got back to the school from there and they knew I was leaving after that game, they took me out. We had a pizza party, you know? So at the end of the day, it was, it was all good. And, and uh, you know, you just got to remain humble when you, when you're having great success and you got to remain positive when you're having great failures and, and try to stay somewhat in the middle if you can. I, I worry about the years to come and, and the next generation of coaches as well that are growing up at a time when they don't see that they, they didn't coach, you know, uh, mi middle school or high school sports. They just want to go straight to college or pro, you know, make a million bucks and, you know, burn everybody along the way or, you know, they really don't have that greater vision and purpose and uh, goal of sport to do something more than just, you know, a transaction. To, so they, they get they get caught up in the spectacle of the media, of the, you know, oh, my gosh, here's another award and another plaque for you. And you're like, we don't we never talk about that way with anybody else. But we, we extol sometimes coaches and put them up on a pedestal. Uh, you know, like, like they're just, you know, monuments to be erected. And we have coaching monuments too. Sure. No. Sure. No, I, I, you're absolutely right. And if, if you don't take that ladder up, if you don't realize, uh, because when you're going up, you, you even if you aren't, even if you do fi finally become that head coach, um, if you haven't learned any lessons along the way about how to handle losing how to handle uh, injuries to key players, um, how, to, how to be a good or bad head coach in treating your assisting coaches, because you, you have all those, assist, you know, all those things, how to juggle family, uh, you know, all those things that you go through that, um, that are part of that. If anybody thinks that coaching is just Saturday afternoons, um, you know, it, it's, uh, uh, it, they're crazy. I mean, back in 2000, one or two, I was, I was honored to be inducted into the National Lacrosse Hall of Fame. And, and uh, the topic, you know, I had had this saying uh, always was, you know, judge your success by what you had to give up in order to get it. And I changed my speech to judge your success by what others had to give up in order for you to get, to get it. Hmm. And, hmm. and, and, and it, when you started, when I started thinking about that and I started thinking about my wife and my mom and my dad and my family and all those other coaches and these players who put up with me, you know, you start to get pretty humble that um, this thing is, is, is huge. And I always laugh now, a lot of coaches use the word family, right? You see it on the back of jerseys or t-shirts. And, and what it is, what I think that they're using that for is, is, it's almost like they've never been in a family. They're, they're, they're talking about Christmas. They're talking about New Year's. They're talking about birthdays, all the great, great things that happen in life. Yeah, well, what happened when grandma died? Or what happened when, uh, you know, you had a fight for that, the last uh, piece, of, piece of hamburger on the plate because you had 10 kids in your family? Or, you know, what, those down times where you were in the, in the living room listening to maybe mom and dad have an argument or, or whatever, or you might have been punished, you know? And, uh, um, if you don't, to me, I, that's why, you know, when we use the word family, we, we explain it about there's, there's love and there's, and there's love. And when you love a, a teammate and you're out on that field or that court, um, with him or with he or she, you're trying to beat the living daylights out of them because you're going to make them better. And that's the love that you're projecting. Now, when you go in the locker room or you go back to the dorm or you go back to your house, now it's. Hey, clean, helping somebody with dinner or cleaning up the dishes or, or putting your arm around a, you know, a teammate that had a rough day. So love is, love is a lot of different things. And, and we try to portray that as best we can. Well, I think we probably have to start wrapping things up. Although I wish we could just keep talking for, <laughs> for another hour. <laughs> well, happy to do it anytime. That's for sure. You guys, you guys are great. I mean, the, the questions are incisive and, and, and they're, uh, you know, for me, they, you know, sometimes you're dealing with what we're dealing with right now of the COVID and will we have a season and injuries and all this stuff. Uh, um, it, it's, it's, uh, I'm thankful for, for, for you guys to allow me to reminisce a little bit. Well, I appreciate your lessons too. I mean, I haven't thought about, 
what you just said there about what other people have to give up to support you and see you succeed is, is, is a pretty profound statement to make too. And, and to show the transformation that can occur uh, in the power of sport. I mean, a lot of people, I don't think look at it like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. So before we wrap up, we always like to ask if you'll share a, a, a coach story with you, either good or bad, but one that that impacted you in your in your journey to become the coach you are today. Well, you know, it's uh, I, as you know, when you've been around this long, there there are so many. I always tell that story about my, you know my my two sons being on the field with me and winning a national championship and. Um, you know, and, and, the, and the one about the high school basketball team, the girls and all that, because I think they're, they're pointing into that. But, um, you know, I, I think as I think back, the ones that, uh, um, that can tell the story a little bit better are those, the, the, the first meeting at Princeton and the first meeting at Denver, when I told young men that were kind of doubtful, kind of had exp bad experiences that we would win a national championship and we would be better. And, 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 and they were, and the fact that they learned that through being more disciplined, following rules and doing that stuff um, kind of made, makes me feel, feel good about, you know, being in this coaching. And uh, you know, it's, it's one, I will tell you one that my, my daughter, my, we have two sons who played lacrosse for me at Princeton. And then my oldest daughter was a basketball player. And then my youngest daughter was a lacrosse player. She's actually the head women's coach at Kent state, but uh, um, you know, two quick stories. My oldest daughter played basketball and they only had one coach and this coach was the most mild mannered guy you'd ever meet, but he got thrown out of a game. And so all of a sudden he looks in the stands and I knew what was coming. He says, you got to come coach the team. And so I go, I don't want to do this. It's my daughter's basketball team. I don't know anything about basketball, obviously. And so, so she takes, gets the ball and somebody takes it out, gives it to Courtney. She's dribbling up the court and this kid kind of hacks her on the arm and the ref doesn't call it. And so I'm, I'm literally coaching 20 seconds. And I say to the referee, just sitting like I am now, you know, that's why uh, he, he disagreed with one of your calls. And the referee turns to me and says, now you're out. <laughs> I got thrown out of a game in 20 seconds. It was, it was the most unbelievable thing. And then in 2000, my younger son, Brendan, as I said, my older son, Trevor, was a first-team All-American goalie. He was, he was a great, great player. But my youngest son, Brendan, was a little undersized. He was 5'9", 145 pounds. But in his sophomore year, he was a backup attackman and, and one of his best friends blew his knee out. So Brendan had a start and here we're in the semifinals against Virginia, 47,000 people in the stands. And I got this group of Virginia people sitting behind me, just screaming the whole game about my, the only reason my son's playing is because he's my son, you know, <laughs> meaning Brendan. The, the, you know. So my daughter, Courtney, who was a little wise, wise potato that she was about 15 at the time or 16, they didn't know she was my daughter. She's just sitting in the stands watching the game. Well, Brendan scores the winning goal against Virginia in the semifinals. And Brian turns around and just, I can't even <laughs> use my fingers to show you what she did to these people. But she turns around and says, that's my brother. And he deserves to play. <laughs> and he just kind of walked off. And so I, I, I still kind of laugh and get choked up about that one because, you know, it's kind of one of those the family things that everybody's involved, you know, everybody's there and, uh, you know, uh, it, they suffer when you lose and, and they hopefully enjoy it when you win. You're, you're a pretty mellow crowd. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. They quieted down for a second or two. That sounds like a good Thanksgiving dinner. That's like, well, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Telling those stories. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on again soon. We really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Megan. Thanks, Brian. And uh, I really enjoy it. So anytime. As we wrap up another special guest Saturday, we thank you for tuning in and look forward to your comments. We also hope you'll join us again next Saturday when we get another chance to shine the spotlight on sport.